Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. How are all of you mothers feeling? Rested, I imagine. Not? No? Uh, hey, I got a couple of um, mom trivia questions real quick, just in honor of Mother's Day. I've got a few prizes to give out for some of these. Um, okay, true or false? 87% of laundry is done by moms. False, it's 88%. But you didn't know, you were guessing. All right. Uh, true or false? 4.2 babies are born every second. See, now you don't know. It is false. It's 4.3 babies are born every second. That's a lot of babies. That's a lot of babies. Uh, the next one is weird for me to say true or false, too, because it says there are 2 billion moms in the world. But if 4.3 babies are born every second, then by the time I started and finished saying that, there's at least 2 billion and 1, right? There could be potentially a new one. So that one I don't get. Take a guess. What is the record number of children born to one woman? Meaning that one woman has given birth to this number of children. I heard, I heard 46, I heard 21. 69 children. Come on. Yeah, her name was Miss Vasiliev of Russia. And she had 69 children between 1725 and 1765. I don't get the math on that, but that's insane. All right. Uh, okay, um, this one, there's a prize, uh, a $10 Starbucks gift card, and I'm going to give this to the first person whose hand goes up. All right, that was you. That was you. All right. And she's a mom. She was quick with it. All right. All right, this is another $10 Starbucks gift card for uh, whoever I feel like is the closest to this one. Um, true or false, the heaviest newborn baby was 22 pounds and 7 ounces. I heard true, it's false, it was 22 pounds and 8 ounces, but just pass this back to the person that said true. I don't know who it was, just throw it back there. And finally, um, this is a $25 gift card to Panera Bread. I'm just going to give it to you for sitting in the front because I really appreciate people that sit in the front. Yes. So, uh, out of a survey of university students um, 40 in Australia, 40% listed their moms as the most important and influential person that they'd ever known. Moms have played a wonderful role. My own mom is this amazing woman, and I'm grateful for her. And so, I'm just going to pray a quick blessing over the mom. So, I want to invite you to do this. If you are sitting next to your mom, a mom, someone you think that might be a mom, I just want to invite you to go ahead and put your hand on their shoulder or just kind of reach out. If you see somebody sitting alone, just assume they're a mom and put your hand on their shoulder. You have my permission. And let me just uh, pray this blessing. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, we thank you for the roles that you have crafted into our lives. God, we thank you that you developed the family unit as a gift to humanity. And Lord, we thank you for the love, the nurture, the support, the investment, the care that so many of us have received from our mothers, from other people's mothers. God, just that spirit that you have put inside of so many individuals to do amazing things for other people. Lord, we pray that you will bless the mothers that are here, that are around, that you'll bless them with joyful memories from their children today. Lord, I pray that you will bless them with somebody else making lunch today other than them. Lord, I pray that you will bless uh, all the moms with just unbelievably restorative sleep every single night that they can wake up in the morning refreshed and able to charge for your purposes. God, we thank you for all that you've done for us through our wonderful mothers. In your precious name, we bless and pray. Amen. Now give them a shoulder squeeze. Give them a shoulder squeeze, a little shoulder squeeze. Um, hey, a uh, couple quick announcements real quick before... Uh, we dig into the scriptures, echoing Josh's uh, weird video announcements about the car show. Car shows this Saturday, and the directors of this car show have just done some remarkable things, and they do it 
uh, to serve the, the community, and they do it to raise money to provide for VBS, which also serves the community, and to send kids to uh, high school camp, junior high camp. And last year, I think they, they raised, I don't know, like $10,000. It was a lot of money. This year, they got a car donated, this, I think it's a Chevy Suburban. Um, and they then, after it got donated, somebody else donated tires. Somebody else did transmission work. Somebody else did a differential thing on it. And so they detailed it. They cleaned it. They redid some upholstery. And they're raffling this off on Saturday, and all the money that it brings in is just going to go to support the children's ministry here at the church. And so we would love for you guys to come be a part of the car show. If you're serving at it, beautiful. If you're helping, like, park cars or register people, beautiful. If you just show up to walk through and be a part of it, beautiful. If you come and win a car and donate it to me, beautiful. Whatever you want to do. And so uh, just know that the whole investment is for the kids. And uh, lastly, or uh, two lastlies, uh, June 9th is our next Baptism Sunday. If you are interested in being baptized, if one of the last times we did baptisms, you went, oh, I would have loved to have done, I just didn't know what was happening, then just know that June 9th is the next time that we're going to be doing baptisms. And if you're interested in being a part of that and getting baptized, we'd love to have you uh, in that. And we're starting a new eight-week uh, book study called Starting Point. It is the basics of the Christian faith. If you are newer to the faith and you're just curious about kind of like learning some of, you know, the basics, the foundational stuff, or if you've grown up in the church and you're kind of going like, man, I would love to just go back through this and try and see this with uh, new eyes again, then we would love to have you be a part of that. You can sign up for that uh, in two ways. You can sign up at the Connection Center outside, or those of you that uh, are tech savvy, you can um, text the word starting to that phone number. That is our text number as a church, and we will get your information and plug you into that. Amen? Amen. All right, let's dig into the scriptures. I've got a question before we actually open the Bibles. Um, how many people here in the history of your education remember ever having to do a group project? Something just happened, the same thing that happened in first service. I heard some groans. How many people used to hate group projects? Okay, that's the smart people. How many people loved group projects? That's the people that didn't want to have to do any work. Like piggybacking on the shoulders of the smart people, right? Yeah, when I, when I mentioned group project in first service, there were some people like, oh, man. And that's because group project to a lot of people, the memory that comes up is you get paired with other people that don't feel like pulling their weight, that don't feel like doing all the work necessary. And if you don't know what a group project is, every now and then teachers to torture students would say, I'm gonna put you in groups of three or four and give you an assignment and you guys have to divvy the work up evenly so that you all do some part of the work and then you make your presentation or you know, turn in the assignment. And inevitably what happens is there's somebody in that group that cares about their grade more than other people. And so they do the work and other people realize, oh, I can skate, right? And that is what I did almost all the time. But there was one time that I remember I was the driving force behind the entirety of the group project. Sophomore year in high school, Mr. Price's English class, I got paired with uh, Otis Craig and then a girl whose name I don't remember. We had to do a report on the 1938 uh, Orson Welles radio play, War of the Worlds. You guys remember this? In 1938, so he adapted a 40-year-old novel, which was about, like, Earth getting invaded by Martians, you know, just from outer space, whatever. And his idea was to create the story as though it was a news report. You know, we interrupt this regularly scheduled program for this breaking news Earth has been invaded by Martians. And so they, it was this super realistic reporting as if we were being invaded by aliens. The problem, at the very beginning they said, and now a radio play on the invasion of Earth by you know, Martians by Orson Welles. But a lot of people missed that part. And a lot of people tuned in to the radio play and just heard Earth is being invaded by Martians. And it was so compelling that there were a number of people that thought this was an actual news report. Police stations were flooded with calls. People started rioting. 
Legend is that some people committed suicide, that there were deaths, that there were murders because there was just pandemonium and chaos. And in the morning, Orson Welles, when it all had become like known, oh, this was a radio play, he was one of the most hated people in America that day because everybody thought he intentionally deceived everybody. So this is what we had to do a report on. And I told my team, I said, I got it. I know what to do. And I wrote our own radio play. I wrote a script. I said, Otis, here's going to be your part. I told the girl, here's going to be your part. I brought in multimedia. I had a tape player, tape cassettes. You guys remember that? Remember that? Uh, to the young people in here, um, before CDs, there were oh, CDs were these discs that we used to put ones and zeros on before it was in the cloud. And to the old people, the cloud is this thing that we put cassettes into, right? And so, like, I had these cassettes with sound effects that, like, we were playing radio, and so I presented the whole thing as like, hey, we're redoing our own radio play. And I knew it wasn't exactly what the report was supposed to be on War of the Worlds, but there was a handful of times in my educational career that I realized I know what the assignment is, but I can do this other thing that will be entertaining enough that they will pass me anyway. And that's what I did with this. I took the lead on the group project once. And every other time, I was the guy you did not want to get paired with. This morning, the reason I mentioned that, we are going to talk about one of the ultimate group projects. One of the ultimate group projects in the Old Testament and one of the ultimate group projects current day in our lives. For the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the story of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. This individual that was living outside of Jerusalem in Babylon and heard this report about the state of the city of Jerusalem, the state of the people, and God put on his heart, you should go rebuild those walls. And so week one, you know, three weeks ago, we talked about how God will put on your heart a desire, a passion. He will compel you to move, to build, to act. Uh, last week, we looked at when you're desiring to serve those purposes of God, you get to choose the influences that you put around you. And you can be intentional and choose influences that are going to lift and inspire you, or you can choose influences that are going to like drag you down and ultimately distract you from God. And this morning, we're going to look at the necessity of doing your part in the group project. And so you can open your Bibles to Nehemiah, but before you do that, if you have your Bibles, hold your Bibles up. I love to see who brings their Bibles. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, we'd love to give you one. And if you just slip your hand up real quick, one of our ushers will just hand you a Bible. That is our gift to you. You can have it. You can keep it. And Nehemiah chapter 2, at this point in the story, Nehemiah has received permission from the king to go to Jerusalem to do this work. He's received provision from the king. They gave The king gave him uh, safe passage, letters to, to get him there, gave him lumber and resource. Now, Nehemiah chapter 2. Uh, in, in between these 10 and 11, he has traveled from Babylon to Jerusalem. Look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, right, we don't know what he did for those three days. Isn't that interesting that that's noted there? Because he's in Babylon, here's this report feels the swelling of God going, you got to go and do something about that. So he, he asks the king, you know, he waits up to four months to make his request of the king. The king gives him permission, sends him with provision, and he goes, and he gets there, and you would think he's going like, it's time to act, it's time to go, let's move. But he gets there and just seemingly sits there for three days, and we don't know what he did. But I will tell you this. I love to believe that he rested, that he took three days and he rested. For one, because he just went through a rather lengthy journey, and also because we see this common thread throughout the entirety of the scriptures that rest is an important part of participating in the mission of God. In the Old Testament book of Ezra, uh, who arrived to do a work in Jerusalem. Chapter 8, verse 32, he, he writes, So we arrived in Jerusalem where we rested three days. 
Multiple times, Jesus called his disciples to rest. Like one example of that is Mark 6, 31. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. And so I love that Nehemiah, so passionate that he travels from one place to another to do this work for God. And when he gets there, he rests. And this morning, the whole message is about you doing your part in the group project, right? And I want to, as I preach and I echo my desire to see everybody serve, my, my desire to see everybody contribute, my desire to see everybody participate in ministry in some way, my desire to see everybody known by other people and knowing other people, I also want you to know that there is just a base level of permission for those of you that simply need to rest. There are people that show up here and I get so excited. Oh, where'd you come from? What do you do? Who are you? And there's, you know, sometimes my excitement, you know, freaks people out. And they go, you know what? I just need to rest for a time. I just need to rest. Like I met one guy. He said, yeah, I've been serving at this other church. Oh, what'd you do? I was one of their worship leaders. And I was like, oh, when can we get you up here? And he went, you know what? I need to just heal for a while. I said, okay, okay. There's permission for those of you that need to rest. It is built into the DNA of our spiritual connection with God to the point that the Sabbath, you know, where God said, take a day, a week, and you just rest. You rejuvenate a day off of the work. As a, as a fitness enthusiast, I recognize that muscle's not built while you're lifting weights. That's when your muscle breaks down. It's built while you're resting. And so there's a lot of people here that God might specifically have you in a time of rest. And that is beautiful. And so he sits for three days, and I'm just assuming that he rests because I see that happen so many other places. Then verse 12, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. So one mount, one horse, uh, probably so as to not draw attention. And Nehemiah sets out to do what? To do some research. He'd heard a report about the state of the walls and the state of the city and the state of the hearts of the people. And he comes from this, you know, other country and he gets there. And in the night, after three days, he goes, let's go check it out. He hasn't told anybody what he's doing. And just one horse, let's not draw attention. Let's not create suspicion. Let's just go check it out. Now, Make some mental notes with this next verse about the state of the city. I would love for you to just try and put a, an image in your mind about what he might have seen, what it might have looked like for him to, to investigate and see the destruction. Because as he's looking and measuring and like pr probably making notes about what, what needs to be done, he is planning. Nehemiah seems to be a pretty legit planner. And hard work is wonderful, but it's not as good as hard work at the right time, in the right place, with the right plan. And so we see that Nehemiah is doing this. Look at verse 13. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well, the dung gate, uh, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. So just picture that for a second. The gates burned. So what I'm picturing is like half charred wood. You know, like part of it is just black. There's maybe some ash. They're open. Maybe they're off the hinges. They're kind of leaned against the wall. For the wall, I'm picturing just like rubble, you know, like where the st solid stone once, once was. It's like kind of like decayed into this just dusty gravel. He's just looking at what once was majestic, and has now decayed. And I love the word right in the very middle of verse 13. Examining. He's examining. He is spending deliberate time focusing on exactly what the actual state of things is. And I wonder how much progress would be made in our own lives, your life, in my life, should we ever pause long enough to simply examine the walls and gates of your own heart and spirit? 
if you were to stop just right now, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and think through your life, is there a part of you that is not quite in line with what God would desire for you? Is there a dysfunction that you're aware of, but you just keep ignoring it? Is there a wound that you just don't quite have the energy to try to heal? Like, just examine your life for just a second. Like, I remember this last week as I was doing this, you know, in the last couple of weeks, there's just been this, like, little, like, dragging in my spirit. And when I recognize these things, I, I got to stop and go, God, what is going on? What am I sensing? What am I feeling? And I felt like the Lord, like, pointed out to me that I'm in the danger zone of letting greed be a motivating factor in my life. And if I shared with you, like, what that is, you might, it might be laughable to you to go, Buzzy, that was your greed, like, that you just didn't want to share that. Like, that's not greed, bro. That's normal. But God said to me in these moments, Buzzy, make sure that your heart is so in line with my heart that greed doesn't even have, like, a foothold. All through just taking the time to stop and just examine. God, what are you saying? What are you doing? And so I see, like, Nehemiah, like, just examining. And there's a beauty for us to do that. Because we have the ability to distract ourselves, to ignore the work that needs to be done in order to just exist. You know, the easiest example I can think of, is there anybody here who your car, like you were driving your car and the engine started making a sound, so you just turned the radio up? Uh-huh. Some of you, yes. Yes. Where you just kind of go like, oh, man, what is that knocking? Let's just play this 80s hairband music a little louder. Hey, the engine's fine. Or you just go, I just want it to go away, right? Now, imagine if that's like just some part of your spirit where you just kind of go, oh, I'm just going to focus on, I'm going to let Netflix drown the sound of this out. I'm going to let this dysfunctional relationship drown out the sound of this thing that I know I need to actually deal with. And so I love this word, examining where he's putting deliberate focus. Verse 14, we see this, this verse again, or this word again. Verse 14, then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. I just love that Nehemiah, even at some point, tries to get his horse through a hole and it just doesn't quite fit. Like, I just love his effort because I just picture, like, Nehemiah is in the wall. I'm trying to get through, squeezing, but I can't fit. Like, he wants to know exactly what needs to be done. And as you and I even just spent, like, 15 seconds, 30 seconds just examining, just thinking through our lives, ah, is there some place where there's a check, a flag, something that God might say, deal with this, focus on this, heal here, grow here, you know, rejuvenate yourself here, work for redemption in this area. And if you found something, like Nehemiah found rubble, destroyed gates, you know, crumbling walls, he found it. And God had blessed him with the understanding of what to do, how to fix it. If you found something, would you know what to do? Would you know? Like if you found a wound, would you be able to go, oh, here's what I need to do with this? Do you have the ability to recognize in your life to, to find something and go, I need to get in therapy. I need it. Or I need to sit in front of a brother or sister and confess. I need to have conversations with people to challenge this part of me. Like examining and finding the area is one thing. But if you find it, are you aware of like how to move forward towards the actual healing? I believe that God makes a way for us to do these things. Look at this in verse 16. The official did not know, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. Because as yet, I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Something pretty interesting here. 
Nehemiah is examining, creating, planning, right? So he has this idea. Here's the work that needs to be done. And then in this verse, he gives us this clue that in his mind, there is a mass group of people that are going to be doing the work. We see that in the last line of this verse 16. He goes, I haven't said anything to the people, the Jews, the priests, the nobles, any officials, any others who will be doing the work. So he's aware this is a massive group project. To rebuild these walls, to restore these gates, this is going to take the investment of everyone. And he hasn't yet conveyed this to everybody because I think what he's doing is he's also examining them to recognize how do I need to convey this to people in a way that they'll come with me on this, that they'll join me in this. Now, let me ask you this question. He says, you know, any of the others that are going to be doing the work, who are those people? Who are the people that are going to be doing the work? Where'd they come from? Who are they? Because there's a possibility that Nehemiah brought some people with him from Babylon. Maybe a couple of Jews came with him. But then there's also the reality that there were people already living there, right? That there was a group of Jewish people living in the city already. And when my mind does the math on that, I have to ask this question. A minute ago, we pictured like the, the rubble, the destruction, the gates, the, you know, the decay. If there were people already living there, how come none of them stepped up to do the repairs? They were there. They were in it. How come nobody that was living there ever put their hand up and went, hey, let's fix this? And there's a couple of things that, that pop into my mind. And the first one is, maybe it felt too overwhelming for all of them. Maybe they noticed it and they just felt too overwhelming. Or maybe, maybe there was not a visionary among them because God specifically sends visionaries into specific places that don't just see what is, but they see what could become. They just have the ability to look at something and go, you know what this could be? Maybe there wasn't a visionary in the mix. And so all they could see was the destruction. But you know what I think is more likely? I think what is more likely is all the people there had completely adjusted, calibrated, and become used to the decayed landscape. Because we as human beings, we do this, man. Like things become part of the landscape and we just stop noticing them altogether. So it's like maybe the first time somebody walked past the destroyed gate, they were like, man, we should do something about that. But where would we even get the wood? I don't know how to weld. I don't know, whatever. And the second time, they go, yeah, I really would love to see that fixed. The third time, they walk past it. They just don't even see it anymore. It's part of the landscape. Even though it's decaying, even though it's destruction, even though it's not ideal, it's just part of the landscape. We do this. The simplest example I can think is, have you ever, like, gathered a stack of books that you were going to donate to, like, a thrift store, and you gathered them, and you set them by the front door, and then the next day you went to leave and you're like, oh, I'm not going by the thrift store today. I'll get those tomorrow. And then the second day you, you just go, oh, yeah, those books. And the third day you don't even see them. They blend into the wall. They're camouflaged. They're part of the landscape. Stack of books. And now you don't even see them anymore. It's the coffee cup that's on the back seat of your car that you set there a month ago, right? And you just go, yeah, I, I'm going to get it. I'm going to clean that at some point. It's just things become part of the landscape. You could step over like a bag of trash three times and it's just now part of the landscape. And there's a spectrum of, you know, it matters to it doesn't matter. Like the reality is a stack of books becoming part of the landscape, it's minor. It doesn't really matter. It's clutter, but it doesn't really matter. Destroyed gates and decaying walls around the holy city of God that leave the people of God vulnerable now we're bordering on major. That's a major part of the landscape that should be addressed. But check this out. If there's any part of your life where you have let a sin, like a thought pattern, a dysfunction, a behavior that you know is not in line with God's best for you, and you've let it just become normal, part of your spiritual landscape, now you're like bordering on 
be detrimental to your connection with God. And so here is this people living amongst the decay that maybe they don't even see anymore. And so God sends this individual with fresh eyes to like point it out. And sometimes God sends people into your lives to highlight certain things that God might want to address in your own spirit, where you maybe have let something become part of your landscape that is not God's best for you. And the, re the reason I bring all that up, because I told you at the beginning, I said this sermon this morning is about the group project and about you doing your part in the group project. The reality is, like there's a group project going on in Nehemiah where Nehemiah wants to gather all the people to do the work and rebuild the walls and rebuild the gates and restore the city to its potential. But for us, right here, right now, today, Christianity is the ultimate group project. Christianity, this mission that Jesus has us on, is, is this ultimate project wherein all the people are supposed to like step forward and go, we want to accomplish this together. It would be absolutely horrific if the collective people went, we'll let Buzz and Stevie B do the work. They're the pastors. They probably know the Bible better than me. Like they, We'll just let them do the work. We'll let the worship team, we'll let them do the work. If we did that, the mission of God would be so stifled by our absence of movement. And I'm aware that the like step one foundational level for the people of God to step forward into participating in the group project is for us to recognize the broken gates and the burned like wood and the decaying walls of our own spirit. There is a beauty in the people of God collectively and individually choosing to say, God, you show me, you speak to me, you reveal to me every area of my life that I need to like get right with you so that I can step into like this holy nation, this godly community and say, I am ready and redeemed and going to serve and going to contribute. Because all these people, they were living in the filth. They were living amongst it. And then Nehemiah steps up and he sees it. And this verse, verse 17, I love how he says this. Look at verse 17. He said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. I love that. You see the trouble we are in. And you know what tone I like to read that verse with? You see this, right? Like, I wonder if he got there and he goes, this is worse than I imagined. How did you guys let it get? Like, do you guys even see it? You see this, right? Like, no. Like, I remember once, I, I think I've told this story before. I used to have this old car. Uh, it was just a horrible, like, beater. And I was driving down the car, the street once, and the, the speedometer cable had come unhooked. And there was, you know, a lot of grease and grime on it just because it was an old car. And the, the speedometer cable had this piece of metal, I think it was a bracket, and it was on the ground, and it was sparking. It was shooting sparks out from underneath the car as I drove down the street. And this lady pulled up next to me in the other lane, and she goes, there's sparks coming out of your car. And I didn't know what she was talking about, but I believed her, and I just went, it's pretty cool, isn't it? She was like, no, it's dangerous, right? Like, somebody else see, sees it and goes, you see this, right? Nehemiah said to them, you see the trouble that we are in. This lies in ruins. The gates have been burned with fire. God sent fresh eyes to, like, reveal to the people the work that needed to be done. And I believe that God would desire to send fresh eyes into your own life. And if you're interested in receiving direction from the Lord, there's a couple of things that, that maybe you could do. The first one is you could invite trusted voices into your life. Men and women that are around you that you go, these are godly people. You can look them in the eye and say, watch me and speak. Tell me what you see. Where do I need to grow? Just, I'm an open book to you. I have people in my life that I've given that voice to. 
Watch me speak, and I will listen when you talk. The second thing is for you to maybe just ask God to speak to you, wherein you can ask the Lord for conviction. You want to see growth in your life, pray the prayer, say something to the effect of, Lord, I pray that you will convict every area of my life that is not in line with you. You pray that and be ready. And I'm not talking about God, make me feel guilty, make me feel ashamed, condemn me. I'm talking about conviction, wherein the spirit of God comes into you and just says, hey, address this, deal with this. And you can't help but to go, yeah, I got to. I know this is not your best for me, Lord. And then the, the last part of just being available to receiving the word from fresh eyes is you got to be willing to do that work. Because Nehemiah goes, you see this, right? Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we'll no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. And I love their response. First of all, Nehemiah is walking around. I examined. He, I, you know, he's doing this stuff. And then he comes and he goes, you see this. So I have noticed it, but do you see it? And then the language shifts to let us rebuild. Like, I'm in it with you guys. And their response is, let us start rebuilding. This massive ultimate group project that is Christianity is the people of God, like saying, Lord, we are available to serve your purposes. And the foundation of all that work begins with each one of us just saying, God, I want to be right with you. I want to be strong. I want to be ready. I want to be holy. I want to be in it. Because when we look at this mission of Jesus, where he sends these people out, you know, like, and, and specifically in Matthew chapter 9, you can look if you want. I'll just read it to you. Jesus went through the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus is watching humanity, and he's just like, oh, man, these people, they need love. They need a guide. They need a shepherd. They need someone to, like, point. They need someone to lead. They need someone to, to follow. They just need this. And this is his summation. He says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He's looking at the people going, there is so much good that could be done. So much that could just blossom up out of these people if there'd be enough people willing to step up and do the work. Christianity is the ultimate group project. And you're all invited to participate. Some of you, your participation right now, rest, heal, let God rejuvenate and redeem you. Some of you, your work is examine yourself the way Nehemiah examined the walls. Some of you, your work is to invite fresh eyes to look at you and like dig with you into how God might want to shift you. Some of you, you've done all of that and it's time for you to step into that next level of service where you're leading, where you're guiding, where you're investing, where you're praying, where you're just in the mix saying, God, I'm ready to be one of the workers for the harvest. We're to be a sent people doing the work of God for the benefit of his kingdom. And when we look at this passage in Nehemiah, we see it takes the work of all of us. And so I just want to invite everyone here this morning to make a commitment to say, God, I'm going to listen for your voice to reveal the places that I've let things become part of my spiritual landscape that should not be there. And if God speaks that to you, your commitment this morning is to act and to move. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for all the ways that you love us. We thank you for the ways that you speak, God. We thank you for the ways that you highlight the work that you want us to do. And Lord, we just pray right now that you will just speak clearly. Send us fresh eyes or just put the voice of your spirit in our minds right now, Lord, wherein we can hear you speak.
very clearly about any specific place in our lives that you want us to address, to advance in, to grow in, to heal in. God, highlight the dysfunctions, highlight the wounds, highlight the fears, highlight the doubts. Bring it all up to the surface in us that we can stand before you with an excitement about the work that you're going to do to make us whole, that we can step into this beautiful group project and be a part of what it is that you want to see happen. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your investment in us. And Lord, we just pray that we will be a people ready to hear from you, ready to move, and ready to respond to any prompting that you give. In the power of your precious name, we pray, Lord. Amen.